In this mini tutorial, I want to talk to you about the cerebellum. Uh, and I want to use this opportunity really to reassure you that the level of detail you need to know about the cerebellum isn't that high. So in terms of the anatomy and the neural circuitry of the cerebellum, I don't expect you to have a detailed knowledge of this. However, I do expect you to be aware of some of the clinically important parts of the cerebellum. So let's look at the images to the left first. And what we've got here um, is a superior view of the cerebellum, okay, at the top. Um, and below that, we've got an inferior view of the cerebellum. Um, and what you'll notice initially um, when you're looking at the cerebellum is that the top of the cerebellum is relatively flat. And it's flat because, remember, it's squashed underneath the tentorium cerebelli, whereas the lower part of the cerebellum, the inferior surface of the cerebellum, is more irregular. And that's following roughly the shape of the um, posterior cranial fossa and with the brainstem in there as well. So the top of the cerebellum is relatively flat, the bottom of the cerebellum is more irregular. What we can see is there are two major parts of the cerebellum. Um, there is this midline structure called the vermis. Vermis means worm. Um, so you can see here it's elongated and a bit worm-like. So there's a midline vermis. And there are two hemispheres, okay? There's a left and a right cerebellar hemisphere, just like we've got for the cerebrum. Um, from a clinical point of view, um, as I said before, the topography... The topographical organisation of the cerebellum is still relatively poorly understood, but we do know that the vermis of the cerebellum tends to be involved in regulating trunk musculature. And as you go more laterally into the cerebellar hemisphere, you then deal with more distal muscles. Okay, And actually this um, also reflects the evolution of the cerebellum. Um, if you look at fishes, for example, they have only just a you know a relatively well developed vermis in the midline but they don't really have any hemispheres as such whereas when you get to mammals with more advanced movements in their limbs and fingers um, we need these big cerebellar hemispheres in order to regulate the muscles in those parts of the body so there's, there's an evolutionary history to the cerebellum just like every other part of the body so that's the superior surface now if we look at the inferior surface, once more we can see the midline vermis there, okay, dealing with the trunk, cerebellar hemispheres, dealing with more distal musculature. But we can see a few additional features which are of some clinical importance. Uh, the first one is what I'm outlining here, this kind of triangular shaped region sitting just next to the cerebellar vermis. This is the cerebellar tonsil, okay, so there are two cerebellar tonsils, one on each side. And the clinical relevance of the tonsils is that if intracranial pressure increases, the cerebellar tonsils can be forced down through foramen magnum, uh, and that can lead to compression of the medulla. Okay? So tonsillar herniation, where the cerebellar tonsils are pushed down through foramen magnum, is a clinically very important entity. Um, another important region to be aware of is this cavity here, which is the fourth ventricle. And remember that the, the fourth ventricle is kind of pyra pyramidal in shape and that sits sandwiched underneath the cerebellum. Okay. The final feature of the underside of the cerebellum I want to point out to you is this surface here Okay, that I'm encircling. These are the cerebellar peduncles. These are the cerebellar peduncles. And these are the places at which the cerebellum communicates with the brainstem. Okay? So we have a superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncle. A superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncle. And the superior cerebellar peduncle communicates with the midbrain of the brainstem. So this is where the superior cerebellar peduncle attaches at the brainstem and the superior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the midbrain. The middle cerebellar peduncle here attaches the cerebellum to the pons. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle. And the inferior cerebellar peduncle here 
attaches the cerebellum to the medulla. Okay, so the cerebellar peduncles are important in connecting the cerebellum to the brainstem. Another reason you need to know about the cerebellar peduncles from a practical point of view is that when we do the dissection of the posterior fossa, uh, we're going to need to cut through these cerebellar peduncles in order to remove the cerebellum itself. So that's all I want to say um, about the cerebellum.